right, I'd like you all to welcome uh, Professor Robert Cowher from uh, Wentworth uh, Institute of Technology. Is that the name of the school? That is the name of the school. <laughs> and uh, I would give the rest of your CV if I knew it. Okay. But he's been a guest here uh, at Reviews and uh, has been a, a wonderful contributor to the discourse. And uh, he's filling in for Hassan and giving us his thoughts on making pieces. So give him your utmost attention, take notes, and then at the end maybe ask him some questions. And, uh, we'll get a dialogue. Okay, I'll try Thank to, um, yeah, feel free to interrupt uh, with, if you have questions along the way. Um, but definitely uh, make note of things that are puzzling to you uh, en route, and um, make sure uh, you're unpuzzled by the time I leave. Um, and I'll leave time. So thank you for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in teaching thesis is um, uh, my colleagues will often say something to my students that I've been uh, hectoring for months. And I will see the light bulbs flash on behind their eyes. Uh, all of a sudden, they completely understand. And uh, there's, then they look at me with this accusation, why didn't you tell me this? And, um, and uh, I point out that I've, you know, basically we're all saying the same thing is my theory, my working hypothesis is we're more or less all saying this, more or less the same thing. Uh, we're just emphasizing different aspects of it, perhaps. Uh, we might be using different terms of reference, different analogies, different hand gestures, different tones of voice. Uh, and so uh, it seems that it, there's no, um, you can't have this me these messages portrayed too many times in too many different ways. Uh, and, uh, and that's just, that's something that's a, a, a daily lesson in the thesis studio for us up at Wentworth. And at Wentworth, we have 78 students completing their thesis this semester. And so we have eight thesis advisors, and we, thus we have eight very different ways of saying more or less the same thing. And so we, off, we have this experience all the time because we know, knowing what we know about how this works, we switch uh, frequently between groups and uh, and so we experience this way and reading through the syllabus of this graduate thesis seminar uh, I recognize the the concepts behind the words even if the words are completely different from the way we describe it in our course it's very very similar so I'm calling this making thesis just so that I think like your instructors have done throughout your career here. Uh, there's an emphasis on uh, making as a strategy for discovery. And uh, I often tell my students that, who tell me that they're thinking about things, and I say, you're not thinking. I can tell because I don't hear anything. And I, I take out my pencil and I say, thinking makes a sound in architecture. It sounds like this. And unless there's a sound, there is no thinking going on. Um, and so it really is uh, thinking through making. You think with your hands. You think uh, with your, maybe it might be your hand on a mouse, maybe it might be your hand on a table saw, maybe it might be your hand on a pencil, but uh, you're, we think through our hands. So um, it's not, uh, unfamiliar to you probably to have uh, this question before you. Um, so what is a thesis? What, what are the, some of the things you come up with? This is the participatory part. Just what is what makes a thesis a thesis? Yeah, that's good. What else? Yeah. Maybe something you want to test. Test. Yeah, that's good. 
cross. Yeah. Yeah, this testing, improving, uh, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, well, one of the things you're noticing uh, probably about this question is how intimidating the question is. And you've probably spent a lot of uh, anxious emotional energy being intimidated by this question. Um, how can I tell when my, my work is a thesis and not just a, another studio project? Um, it causes so much anxiety in, in students around me, I've noticed that I actually try to avoid the, this question. I actually try to avoid the word thesis as much as I can. I, I had to give up because there's no avoiding the word. Um, but then I, I make the question more specific. And somehow this question is less intimidating. And so um, I'd like you to think about how can research advance through drawing? And when I say drawing, uh, I want you to hear the word making. It's just making is, is a non-conventional use of, of terms. Um, so when I say drawing, I mean making something, making a drawing, making a model, printing out something, making through uh, the computer. But how can research advance through drawing? Is that an easier question? Or is that harder? Well, let's try it. How can, I, I want to I hear from you guys. How can research advance through making something, through drawing something? Yeah, so again, the word testing and lowering the stakes by testing it in a way where no one gets hurt. The only budget that you're blowing through is your own precious time budget and uh, the cost of the trace or, or the plywood or whatever. And so that's good. So testing with the low stakes. How else can research advance through making things? Comparison, yeah. That's a really good thing. Yeah. That's really interesting. So you start out with no end goal, but along the way you stumble on things that uh, suddenly become useful somehow. Yeah. So um, one of the things that, so that th your answers are, are all uh, foreshadowing of what I'm about to say, so maybe I can say it quicker because you seem to be on board with a lot of these things. Um, but one of the things that I, I find that uh, helps a lot um, is uh, playing by Missouri rules. I, I establish certain rules in my classroom uh, right from the start. As a matter of fact, usually when I address students, I say, I am number four. I say, my name is Robert Cowherd, and I am number four. And then I, I want to make sure that's clear right from the start, because it can be very confusing. Rooms uh, that we use for teaching are set up in a very confusing way. Um, they tend to face the one person who's doing most or all of the talking, and uh, it gives the false impression that the speaker 
in today's case, me, that the speaker is the most important source of understanding in what we're doing here. And so that's why I feel obligated, ethically obligated as an instructor to say, I'm number four. I'm not the most important source of understanding. I'm not even the second most important source of understanding. On a good day, on the best of days, I am number four. I'm the fourth most important source of understanding. So can you think of what's, what's a better source of understanding something than the teacher? Or yourselves, uh, especially when you are using that as a plural, like your colleagues, right? You may have been told uh, at some point that you're likely to learn more from your classmates than you are from any of your instructors. Have, have you ever, who's been told that? Is it true? Or are we just being falsely humble? Is it true? Are you, are you learning more from your instructor? Yeah, even if we're saying the same thing or trying to do the same thing, your instructors, in a way, are the least qualified people to teach you because it came relatively easy for us. That's how we got here. Some, some not me so much, but I, I had a very hard time in school. But um, your colleagues are struggling through the same things you're struggling through, and so they have a way of... Uh, having insight that's useful when your instructors uh, are more or less clueless about. So I, I, I say your colleagues are number three. Um, so what, what's more important than your colleagues or your instructor in terms of what can offer you understanding? Like the important things that you need to discover and understand where do you get those things from? Yeah. Research. research. And how do you engage in research? Like, what are you actually doing when you research? Trying to answer your own questions. Yeah, so your own questions are a tool for discovering things that are useful. What are some other tools that we use to discover useful things? What? Precedents. And what do we do with precedents when we identify them? We question them and answer those questions. But what are we really doing? Like, what are we actually doing? What are we doing with our hands? With our hand minds? We're drawing. And we're cutting sections. And we cut sections with our hand mind. We draw perspectives with our hand mind and uh, we do all these we do all these things with our hand mind that architects have been doing even if we do it with a computer it's kind it's 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 still a, on a continuum of what architects have been doing since there have been architects and, and actually it's what humans have been doing even before there were architects uh, we are using these methods that we call architectural tool, ar architectural methods. We're using these methods to ask questions and to test possibilities and to explore uh, in a way that gives us insights, that yields discoveries that are not available to other humans who are not using those tools. So I call, this is going very well. You guys are going right in exactly the correct order. Um, I call the tools of architecture, especially architectural analysis, I call that number two. The second most important source of understanding in what we do are the outcomes of our engagement through the tools of architectural understanding. Plan, section, 
axon, all of those things, perspective, model making. It allows us, it gives us insight, it makes available understandings that are not available if you are not doing those things. If you don't do those things, uh, it's, it's like a superpower that you've been given over the course of the last four years. It better be a superpower given how much it costs, right? So this is really uh, like x-ray vision. Uh, you, you have access to things that normal people don't have access to. And architects are not normal people, I guess, is the implication there. So if that's number two, what's number one? What's the single most important source of understanding that is at the root of everything? It's not the teacher. That's, that's an interesting response, but um, that's, not, that's not where I was going. He said. he said ourselves. That's number three. You're one of the, you're part of this group, and you guys are very important. What? Yes, thank you. You just made it. So the world itself is the single most important source of understanding. So uh, we go out into the world, and uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's some things that you're going to have to deal with. And um, we're really sorry about that. But these things that you're dealing with are in large part the problems that are the unintended consequences of a tremendously successful run that we had. You're in the generation of your older instructors. We had a fantastic run in the 20th century. We were successful beyond our wildest dreams. No generation in human history has been more successful than we have been in the post-war generation. But it came with some unintended consequences. And one of the important reasons for us to be demoted down to number four is that if you do what we did, what's going to happen? more of the same and this planet cannot afford more of the same so sorry about the mess good luck here's a few hints that we've learned from the hard lessons of failing in the midst of so much success so um, Missouri rules are called Missouri rules why do you know what's on the Missouri license plate Has anyone traveled a bit? Yeah, but I can't think of what's on that one. You can't think of that one? No. It's the show me state. It's the show me state. Okay. Stump the professor. Why is it called the show me state? <coughs> oh, probably something to do with uh, touting livestock properties during the World's Fair. It probably does. But that's deeper than my knowledge. <laughs> um, but... Uh, so basically, a senator a hundred years ago, or it doesn't matter, a long, long time ago, uh, was criticizing the fancy pants, articulate, uh, s smooth talking salesman in Congress who was saying, Trust me, this is going to, this bill, if you pass it, will do this, this, and this. And the senator from uh, Missouri said, Sir, I am from the state of Missouri, and in the state of Missouri, you got to show me and you, before we will buy what you're selling. And so that was the birth of the, the state motto. Missouri is the show me state. So I don't know if uh, you have this problem. Let me guess. I think you do have this problem where your colleagues or maybe even you might get caught in this trap. You're presenting some ideas. And you have some fantastic, very important ideas. And so you are presenting those ideas either at a desk crit or perhaps even at a pinup. And uh, you're looking up here or you're using hand gestures. 
or you're not pointing, you're just talking. Who's been in that situation? Who's experienced a colleague in that situation, trapped with, trapped with all these brilliant ideas, but nothing but hand gestures to show for it? So um, I was in a review yesterday where my colleague, who everybody loves, he, he's always smiling, and, and people just have a warm spot in their hearts for him. Um, and he said to the student, can you just cut the bullshit? And I was like, oh, my God. And I said, okay. And, of course, he gets away with it because he's such a lovely person. I could never get away with that. And so what I have learned to say is, please play by Missouri rules. You're not allowed to say anything that you're not showing us. And as you're showing us, you have to bring out your most important uh, weapon of presentation is your finger. Give us the finger. Not that one. But point to what you're talking about. And so, um, so we proceed through everything we do uh, in a very disciplined manner uh, when we're playing by Missouri rules where we're not allowed to just talk about ideas. If you want to talk about, if you want to earn the right to talk about ideas, you have to draw those ideas, as in make something so that uh, you can point to what those ideas are. And um, we have learned to structure the thesis making process in three stages. And we got this last year from a colleague who had been teaching at MIT. And we hired him. Um, and he came over to Wentworth. And um, he said, it's really about identifying an issue, taking a position on that issue, and then working with the architectural effects that are capable of impacting that issue. And so um, back to uh, our apology, our generation to your generation, sorry about the mess, good luck. Um, if, you're, if you're paying attention and you care, uh, you will notice that your career is going to be, face, be, be facing individually and collectively a set of challenges that no one has ever faced before. So what challenges matter the most? That's the issue. And you're probably doing that through a series of exercises in this course. And then uh, what must be done? What position do, do rational people take to have the right impact, to push those issues in the right direction? And uh, you might recognize in the phrasing of this um, something that both, uh, I think, Tolstoy, not Tolstoy, Trotsky and Jesus said, what then must we do? It's great that you have all this great education and you understand so much about the world through your uh, great architectural tools. You have this fantastic insight. But then, but then what? What are you going to do about it? Um, yours is the generation of taking action, of taking command, of, of, of embracing the, your agency and doing something about it. So what, what do you have to do? And then, what can architecture do? Now, what's wrong with the sequence of this? What if you get to the question, what can architecture do? And uh, the issue and position that you've identified is uh, very remote and difficult to establish any architectural impact that could possibly have an impact. Who's experienced that in this process? So, so what, did, what did you do? What, what was it? Did you, like I can imagine that you identify what's most wrong with the world, identify what must be done about it, and then say, 
okay, well, should I switch majors to political science now because the problem is Congress or the problem is, you know, the president or the problem is the mayor of my town? So um, if you just do it in this order, you could find yourself in an extremely awkward position. But if you've made a commitment to an issue and you've taken a position on that issue and you get to a point where there's really nothing architecture can do and even more pointedly, maybe architecture, architecture can do, have an impact, but it's difficult it's a difficult impact to document. So you can't just have faith that architecture is going to have an impact. You have to be able to test it, and you have to be able to demonstrate that architecture can have an impact. So you, there has to be a means, there has to be a method for establishing what architecture, what the effects of architecture are in relationship to that issue and position. So, so what's the best strategy? If you find yourself uh, having to abandon architecture or go back and find a new issue and position, what, what did you, so what, what have you done? What, did, what are some strategies? And notice I, I left some space at the top. So it's not crazy to start from a, a sense of what architecture can do and anticipating that you're going to be asked to develop an architecture that does something. It's not crazy to start with the architecture and then based on your sense of what architecture can do to identify possible issues and pop possible positions on those issues before you engage in this. And if you've stumbled and found yourself cycling back and revisiting the beginning process, it probably, is this familiar? Is this something you guys find yourself doing? Uh, and really you've been anticipating this for several years as you move through the program. Uh, at one point or another, your instructors may ask you the question, um, as, as you're approaching this semester, where you have to identify what it is you're going to work on, what have you worked on in the past that has left lingering questions, what have you worked on in the past that seems to have potential for further advancement? Uh, so uh, this is just a way of making explicit something that probably you are already doing anyway. And so this is uh, how we've tried to structure the, the process of guiding our students through the process of the thesis year. So um, our program is different from your program. Our program is different from any program. And it's a strange, uh, maybe this is a better way to look at it. We have two thesis prep courses. And this is largely uh, the product of how we came to be uh, a, a graduate program in architecture. Um, we're, we're the first program at Wentworth to uh, have a graduate program. So architecture led the way. There are several graduate degrees now, and we're actually officially a university. Um, but in 2008, when we were looking at adding the master's degree or switching from a bachelor's of architecture, which is, I think, what happened here, right? You switched from bachelor's to master's. Um, the Architecture Accreditation Board actually makes it a very easy process, or they used to, to switch from a Bachelor's of Architecture to a Master's of Architecture. Yeah, so you have to do it. Yeah. Um, you actually had to make a case back in the day, 10 years ago, 
you had to make a strong case why you weren't switching. Um, if you were switching, you were basically checking the box. So that was not our hurdle. Our, the Accreditation Board for Architecture was pushing for this. But we had to prove to the New England uh, Association of, of Schools and Colleges, NEASC, we had to prove to them that Wentworth uh, was up to the task of moving from undergraduate education to graduate education. And so we focused a lot, and I was on the team that did this, on developing our methods course, which looks like this. So every week there's a reading, the students write about the reading, and then they sit down in a room like this, around a round table, and there's a discussion. And there are lots and lots of awkward silences as your classmates look around and say, okay, I'm not going to say anything. Uh, you can't make me talk, right? Mm. So does that sound familiar? So, no, we great. That's great. Um, so we split that off, uh, which creates some problems. I don't recommend it if you can avoid it. So the pro and so in the so that's our methods class where we do a lot of reading and writing, and th in the process of doing all of that stuff, uh, students are developing uh, a large term project. Do you guys have to do that in here? Do you have to write something big? It's bigger than they think. Yeah? How long is it? Well, uh, it, it generally pops out around 20 pages. Wow. But they don't realize that, that we're going to ask them to do that yet. Uh -huh. We haven't asked them to do it. Well, yet. don't tell them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that'll, that'll terrify them. You can do it. Um, so we do that, and basically we set it up like a literature review. We basically ask you, what architect? So it's partly precedent study and partly uh, review of people who've been writing about those issues before you came along to look at it. And so it's it's basically precedent studies uh, extended from built architecture to precedent studies of the precedents in the literature, like what books precede you, in, in asking similar questions. And in a way, this research follows Missouri rules, if you think about it. Like when I went to graduate school, um, my instru I would write a whole bunch of stuff uh, with no footnotes and no references, and my instructor would say, what are you doing? You're not allowed to say anything. Basically, it boiled down to, you're not allowed to say anything unless you can point at evidence that what you're saying is backed up by someone else or some evidence in the world, whether it be your take on that person's architecture, um, you got to show us. You can't. Otherwise, it's just an essay of how you feel. And this boils down to my hesitation when you when um, when you identify the individual as being number one, number two, number three, number four. Notice I have not, I haven't even said where you are as an individual. As the individual creator, you're nowhere on that list. Uh, we can come back to that. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. So um, it's not about you. Get over yourself is what I tell my students. You're just a vehicle. You're an instrument you have agency, you, you're steering this ship, and you can decide which direction the ship goes. But ultimately, it's not about you. And so you're gathering precedents that present evidence that allow you to say things that, you, that need saying. And you are gathering precedents in the literature uh, that allow you to uh, point to other people who are saying things that you think are useful. So you're the editor of the world. 
That's a pretty powerful position. That's enough power, right? Don't ask for more power than that. You're in this stage of the development. You are editing the world. You're looking at the world and you're identifying what matters the most. You're identifying issues that matter the most. And you're looking for evidence both in what people have written and the architectures that have been produced. You're looking for evidence that can support your journey, uh, your claim that this issue is important, this issue matters in terms of the challenges of the 21st century, and there are pros and cons to different positions uh, that one could take on this issue. And so, um, we split into two courses what you guys have kept intact in a single course. We've tried to put it together, but it was disastrous. We might try again someday. But um, I suspect instead of doing that, we'll just make the thesis studio two semester sequence. Wow. Plus this course. Plus one of these two courses. The design, the the design is research where they're doing a lot of analysis um, and testing of ideas, design test. Those words probably make little or no sense to you because you're all doing the same thing, but you're using different words. So is methods kind of like an advanced theory course? Or yes, or? methods is more an advanced theory course. Um, and anticipating this transition, I'm trying to, don't tell anyone, but I'm kind of manipulating the administrators above me. And I said to my good colleague, Jen, Jen, Jen Lee Michalishan, I said, Jen, whatever you do in your design is research course, I'm just going to take that and I'm going to do it some more and call it the thesis studio. And that's what we're doing right now. So it's kind of a bold experiment. I was the coordinator of the research methods, the advanced theory course, and I'm the, quarter, I'm the coordinator of the thesis studio as well. So the context of this is that I've been given a lot of responsibility for the sequence of the thesis program, which is two thesis prep courses funneling into a, a thesis studio. Uh, and uh, so I'm sharing with you some of the behind-the-scenes thinking that should shed light on um, what I'm presenting to you as a set of terms of reference that you might find familiar because I suspect your faculty are saying very similar things to you. Um, uh, but I might be saying it in a different way. So any questions so far? Maybe back on that. You know, if you look at the structure of this course, I think you can identify these different components uh, are all in there somewhere. Like you're doing readings, you're having seminars, you're writing stuff, you're also looking at precedents, and you are performing graphic analysis, I believe. Right? Yeah. This is a sequence that's intended to like be taken all in the same semester, so it's yes. classes but at the same time. Yes. Okay. So we have two four credit classes. Thesis prep one and thesis prep two. You can you believe it? And you'd think that students would be prepped after all that <laughs> prepping. Right? But in the past what we found is students get to the thesis semester. And they start over from scratch. Have you experienced that? No. OK, good. I would not wish that on anybody. And uh, well, is this usually in the fall and then the thesis is in the spring? Yes. Because we do it year round. Yeah. So the people who uh, take thesis prep this semester have a real advantage because they have the whole summer to marinate, you know, and to sort of say, you know, what do I need to do? between May and September to sort of amplify, you know, my preparedness to actually do the work. So that if you don't have all your site information, if you haven't visited your site, mm -hmm. and all those kinds of things, you can do that over the summer. The people who do it 
uh, in the fall and then do the thesis in the spring are a little more crunched because they only have the winter semester and nobody wants to go to Detroit in January, mm -hmm. you know, and, and walk around and sit on their site for, you know, like all day and to sort of direct, observe, <laughs> directly observe the sights and sounds, you know, whereas summer people have a little bit, bit of a break. So, you know, it, it is uh, different depending on what semester you start. So which group is more likely to say, oh, I've got to start over? Uh, well, we, we try to create a condition where, you know, we don't have that. Occasionally you get someone at the end of the summer saying, I've rethought the whole thing. So it's more likely to happen in September. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I would suspect. Yeah. We don't want students to have a lot of time <laughs> to think about things between the two semesters because our biggest problem is students think too much. Well, that's not our problem. <laughs> you, you, mu you must have some way to discipline <coughs> these students so that they don't wander off. We have to use Missouri rules. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to take up too much time. But no, no. Know, this it is seems as if that our students are so invested in what they're doing that they just can't bear the thought of you know, like doing something else. Excellent. I'll have to figure out what your secret is. Um, so every time a student says, oh, I've been thinking about it, I have to start over. And my response as coordinator is, starting over is you coming back next September and paying tuition again. And that usually cures them. I said, I think I think what you mean is you're going to pivot. There's either persevere or pivot. That's the only two options. The third option is start over by coming back in September uh, and paying your tuition all over again. Um, so so uh, we translate this issue position effects and really it's effects, issue, position, effects, uh, into the question, what matters most for your, your exploration? And you need to translate what matters most into explicit, a list of explicit criteria of what it is you're testing. Right? So testing came up when we were talking earlier. What are you testing? Do you all have a sense of what matters, and are you able to articulate it as a test? So that's what we ask our students. And then comes the drawing part. We're back to making. If you're testing, what is the test? And in architecture, plain by Missouri rules, the test is some form of making. You can't test things by talking at it. You can't test things by talking about it. You can't test things by making hand gestures in the air. We're back to the sound of thinking, the scratching of the pencil, the scraping of the block of wood, the mouse and, and the pixels and the ones and zeros flying across the computer screen, all of that makes a sound. And, and every time you draw something, you are testing. So why do we draw? When you make a drawing, think, think about the last drawing you made. Everybody, can you think about the last drawing you made? OK. Quick, why did you make that drawing? Let's go around the circle. Why did you make that drawing? Visual, visualize space. Visualize space. Why did you make that drawing? Uh, see where the mass would fit on the site. See whether the mass would fit on the site? Why did you make that drawing? To see what my idea looked like. Okay, C cutting to the chase. Why did you make that drawing? Test different design options for site. Why did you make that drawing? And why did you make that drawing? Uh, site analysis. Okay. <laughs> so that is so refreshing, and maybe it's because we're at this time of year. But I really like those answers. The answers that I don't like 
Um, are the ans are the the reason to make a drawing uh, is to show my professor, or for the pinup, for the review that's coming up? I had to draw it for the review, or the worst answer. What's the worst answer of all? Why you drew it? It it was a requirement. The worst answer of all times. It was a requirement. I needed for the review to present it. Those are the kinds of drawings where you shut down the design machinery. You shut down your brain. So you're making that sound of thinking. Remember what it sounds like? Here it is again. A little loud in here. You can't hear it. That's the sound of thinking. You know what it sounds like because you've done it. But that's, it is possible to make the sound of thinking and not have any thinking. A horrifying thought, right? But when students are making presentation drawings, often you're, you might be thinking, but you're thinking about um, superficial things. Or some of my students, I don't know if you've ever, no one here would ever do this, I know. But there's a movie playing. Because we have these machines that are really good for playing movies. Sometimes there are movies playing while students are making models. You, you, I swear, it really happens. You don't believe me, right? It happens. They believe Every single one of them does it. And I, I see the X-Acto knife perched up here and the student frozen while, you know, Demi Moore is, yeah, the aliens are, pow, you know, and it's like the blood on the screen is about to become the blood in your lap, right? Um, so the, the most important reason to draw a drawing or make a model is not to show your ideas clearly to someone else. The most important reason is to show the ideas to you. The most important reason to make anything is to reveal understandings. Remember number two? It's to reveal something that nobody else has access to. You, because you have the superpower of architectural representation, have access to understandings that normal people don't have access to. And that is the number one reason to make anything, is to reveal those insights about number one, the world. You make number two to get understandings about number one. The first and most important revelation of your drawing is the discovery of something new that you are uncovering, not to show your professor, your professor is just number four. Not to show your colleagues even, your colleagues are number three. Yes, they're important because maybe they can interpret what is being revealed in a way that you can't interpret, right? So sometimes we make things and we don't know what just happened, right? So we look at it. So let's look at examples and this is the home stretch. I'm gonna run through a lot of examples. Yesterday, Billy uh, showed me this. Uh, and what he's doing is uh, he's drawing in his sketchbook. But then I'm going to cut to the chase. This is, and then he's, he's blowing, he's scanning it. He's drawing in his sketchbook. He's scanning it. He's blowing it up. He's punching up the blacks because I think he's working with a pencil here. And then he's printing it large, and then he's drawing on top of that print. And then he's presenting it, and as he's presenting, uh, he is, as he's talking, he's labeling things, he's putting, he's adding in red arrows and notations, and, he's, and it's kind of uh, intoxicating, so the rest of us, the critics, are standing up. And we're adding arrows, and we're adding notations. And this is my idea of a good time. I, maybe it's sick, but 
And we, he is inviting us into this exploration. This is Chicago. He did go there in January, uh, in December. He did get stuck there in a snowstorm. He did talk to whoever was there. And where he was is in probably one of the most dangerous few blocks that you can be in, in the United, and still be in the United States. Uh, it's the former site of the Robert Taylor homes that were so crime infested, they demolished them over the past uh, decade. And he's proposing something to replace it. But that's not as important as the way he's drawing. He is drawing as a method of discovery. So I just want to look at this a little bit. So he started with an axon, and he's using massing of different program elements. And then he's drawing it in section, and then he's drawing it in plan. But he says, no, no. Uh, and then he's going over it with orange to try to look at circulation patterns. And he decides right away that not only are, is this arrangement of masses wrong, but this sequence of drawings is wrong. So he's critiquing the content of what he's drawing, and he's critiquing his method of testing and asking questions. So right away, he does a second iteration. And he starts with the plan. He says, no, no, I got to do the plan first, then the section, then the axon. And so that becomes his method from that point forward. And so he does plan, section, axon, and he tests the, the quality of circulation in orange. And then learning, he said, I like this, but I don't like that. Right? And I'm not sure what he's, I'm not sure what's happening in his head. But I've told all of my students, you need to do something, and it almost doesn't matter what you do. Imagine an instructor telling you that, that it doesn't, almost doesn't matter what you do. Right? I, I tell my students, the first thing you do almost doesn't matter. It's the critique of that first thing, the instructions that are generated by that critique, it's the second thing that matters. Does that sound familiar? Have your instructors told you that in different terms? So you, you point at what is working and what is not working, what you like and what you don't like. And then you struggle, and this is the hardest part, why don't you like it? Why is it not working? Why do you like it? Why do you think it is working? And what do you mean by working? And that gets us back to the criteria. When you identify something as being successful or not so successful, you are critiquing it in both positive and negative ways. But if unless you convert that critique into reasons why or a logical uh, understanding of what the characteristics of success and failure are, you are about to head into the vortex of hit and miss. Like you design something, you don't like it. So you design something else, you don't like that. You design something else, you don't like that. Does that sound familiar? Have you done that? That can work sometimes, but it's not very reassuring. If God speaks to you in your dreams, this can be a great way to proceed. Who... who who does not have God whispering into your ear at night and telling you what to do? Some of you have God whispering into your ears? No, so you know what I mean. Uh, hit and miss can work if you're lucky or you're di divinely inspired. But we can do better than hit and miss. That's why we have critique. That's why you have crits. That's why you have critics. And the root of all that uh, comes back, brings us back to criteria, right? You have crit rooms. You have desk crits. What are the criteria that are driving all these crits? Crit, crit here, crit, crit there. What is driving these crits? The criteria. What matters? Why are you judging this to be successful? Why are you judging this to be a failure? I'm not sure why Billy is judging uh, success and failure the way he is until he gets here. You see that? What is his criteria? He's made an improvement. What, are, what, are, what is one of his criteria for success?
Remember, that's a section. And he's adding the notation not to scale, but then he puts a human in there to make it to scale. What do, what do you think his criteria? Just take a guess. Open space. Yeah. He's saying openness matters. OK. And the next one. So now he's done with those exercises. He's presented it to us. And we've said, well, you need to go back and you need to look more carefully at certain things. And so this is his next attempt. He's drawing plans on the left and sections on the right. And now he is making some bold claims about something to do with plus and minus. Like what he wants to attract people into the building. He wants to create interiorized public space. And he wants, that sounds like a, an interesting challenge. And he is saying, this is an attractor in section. This is an attractor. And so you're seeing the further development of the criterion that he has identified in the previous step. So you see what's happening. He's showing it in section. He's also speculating on how things might work in plan. He's also rediscovering, as if he never read Jane Jacobs or anything, uh, the def definition of space uh, as a way of making people feel comfortable. And now I'm going to pick up the pace, and he's extruding the sections, and he's using yellow now to identify things that work and don't work. He's putting human bodies in there, uh, and he's opening up the things to section, and now he's introducing a new method of testing. He's introducing the perspective drawing, and he is testing whether uh, spaces are capable of attracting humans or, or more or less capable of attracting humans based on the criterion uh, openness, especially vertical openness, is an attractor. And he did this in the space of a week. He was going to make a huge model of the south side of Chicago because he really liked the idea of having at his final presentation uh, a model of the south side of Chicago to demonstrate how his proposal was going to transform the city of Chicago and make it safe for development to move southward. Right? Wonderful thing. I said, you should definitely do that. Not now. Not yet. You have to take care of the central business of what forces are driving the form making of your architecture what are your criteria? What are your methods for testing those criteria? And how can you tell when something is being successful or not? And these are his latest drawings. Actually, his latest drawings, he was supposed to submit this morning, but uh, I had not seen them. I didn't call him up, but um, uh, he's, got, he's got some more drawings that I've already seen yesterday afternoon that I know these are not the latest. But he's starting to introduce circulation, uh, and uh, the forms are starting to be generated. So, uh, and, but most excitedly is that the design process doesn't end with his little sketches in his sketchbook, which for a lot of people, the design happens in the sketchbook, and then everything else is architectural rendering. The movie comes on, the uh, V-Ray generator, plug-in comes in and it's over. The design machinery has been shut down and it's the render farm has been geared up, right? But that's not what's happening here. Every time he draws, he's pushing, he's asking questions, he's testing, 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 uh, and he's sharing his exploration of testing with his colleagues, number three, and with his critics, number four. And we are so drawn into the live action, uh, interactive, the design is happening as he speaks. The design is happening as we respond. The design is happening on the paper, on the wall, in the crit room. It didn't end a week earlier so he could produce cadavers with his auto cadaver software to hang on the wall. 
So this is a presentation that was made, say, three weeks into the semester? Yes. Yeah, of the final. Thesis. Yeah. Thesis semester. So he's got a long ways to go, but he is moving quickly. There's fast, there's multiple iteration going on uh, constantly um, with him. Um, so three years ago, I had a thesis student who uh, had the courage to trust my, I, I said these things to him that I'm telling you. He had the courage to just turn over <clears throat> um, his soul to me and uh, do what I said in terms of method. Um, that's how confident he was because he was exceptionally talented. And uh, I'm not sure what inspired him to trust me to this level, but uh, he basically structured his process of production according to these principles of, I would ask him what matters most, and I would require him to define that in terms of criteria. And then I would say, for each one of those criteria, I want you to develop a specific method of representation, of testing. And I want you to, every time you run a test, I want you to identify successes and failures. And then I want you to try, as best you can, to articulate what are the characteristics of success, what are the characteristics of failure. And I, then to reinvest that into the development of new criteria and repeat. And so I'm not sure why, but he did that. I'm not sure if that helped him or hurt him. It might have dragged him down because he's clearly very talented. But I'd like to think that it actually uh, uh, helped accelerate his progress. Um, and that's what he says. So. I'm inclined to trust him. <clears throat> so the first thing he did in January, when I told him, it doesn't matter what you do, just do something. It can be completely arbitrary. And he said, arbitrary like taking the great monuments of architectural history uh, over the course of 2,000 years and taking the plans, uh, eliminating any sense of scale to those plans and assembling them in the manner of a collage and then drawing it as a section. And I said, yeah, that sounds sufficiently arbitrary. And he said, okay. And that's what he did. And that's what this is. It's a complete folly um, that sh is not intended to ever be built as architecture. Uh, but it was intended to serve as an armature for architectural critique. And so I said, what do you like and what you don't like? Is there anything that you like anywhere in here? Are there any moments of architectural power or potential? Um, and equally as important to things that have architectural potential, are the things that are absolute disasters. Actually, disasters are sometimes more instructive than successes. Success can be subtle, disaster rarely so. And so he produced this uncritically, and then he applied critique to it. He looked at it very carefully, and he said, there are some moments that are more successful than other moments when you take these arbitrary plans and interpret them as section. And can you form your own opinion? Can you see what would you point to and say this is successful? And what would you point to and say this is a failure? <clears throat> How about the lack of railings? <laughs> One doesn't want to apply that, you know, that set of criteria to okay. this as an exploration. But is there a space you would not want to be in? Or a space you would like to be in? Well, how about there? 
he was unable to populate the Guggenheim. I think that's the Guggenheim. He was unable to, there was no human occupation possible in the Guggenheim plan in section. Failure, right? Pretty clear. This is not so great. This is horrible, right? Oh, so yeah, and then, and then there's this. That's Corbusier. So maybe, I'm not sure, but these look, maybe these are more successful and these are less successful. Anyway, he then proceeded to create a catalog of relative success and a catalog of relative failure. See, there's that un, unoccupiable piece of the Guggenheim. Um, and so that was the first step. He did something that was arbitrary, he critiqued it, he identified successes and failures, and then he identified criteria based on what he, he chose as success or failure, and then he moved on to the next test. And so he took successful segments of that plan and he extruded it in one direction. And he explored that, put people into it, and he cataloged uh, successes and failures. And he says that there are implications of volumes, even though there are no articulate, there are no specifically enclosed envelopes here, but there's the, inter the implication of enclosure in even these uh, extrusions. And again, he catalogs success and failure. Still, not anything I would propose as architecture, right? It's completely arbitrary. But just hold on to your seats because then he takes the most successful extrusions from the last iteration and he combines them rotating 190 degrees. And he explores those and creates a catalog of successes, relative success and relative failure. Learning from those successes and failures, he goes to uh, number four. And now he is combining those clusters together to see whether they will accommodate uh, an assemblage. And now he's using perspective to test whether for successes and failures. And again, he creates a catalog of relative successful spaces as judged by the perspective produced and the relative failure. And this is something I find myself telling students constantly. If you're not sure if it's working or not, put humans into the drawing. The human beings are the ultimate uh, critics of success and failure. If you put humans into your drawing, they will tell you. If you listen to what they have to say, they will tell you whether it's working or not. And if you can't hear what they're saying, maybe your colleagues, number three, can help you hear what they're saying. Or maybe your instructors on a good day, number four, can help you understand. And you can always ask your mom. Right? She'll tell you. Why am I sending you to this school? So it continues. He starts now and only now does uh, he bring in the question of vertical circulation and structure. Until now, these assemblies are more or less structure-y, like they are structure-ish. They are not yet satisfying the needs of a, a structure. And by the way, does he have a site? Yes. A series of three abandoned blocks, actually not that different from the Chicago site, in Lower East Side of Manhattan, uh, right by the Williamsburg Bridge you, on Delancey Street. Do you know that place? Do you know that? Um, and so he's bringing in vertical circulation and a sense of structure. And he's testing for that. Uh, and then he's uh, testing other things, and it just keeps going. He is making uh, a tower. Uh, and now he's looking at uh, the site. Now only here in the sixth round of development, and it's about a week per round. So uh, he is bringing it to the site and seeing if it's working on the site. Oh, it's not just one tower, it's two towers. Actually, it's four towers by the time he gets to the end. 
And now he's looking at what happens on the street. And he's testing how these things meet the street. And he's starting to uh, become more conventional in how he's expressing it and showing it so it can be comparable to other architectural experiences. And he's integrating it with the uh, subway station that's there on Delancey Street and the low line. He's integrating it with the low line, the underground trolley station that uh, has been proposed to be developed as a park underground. Uh, and this, these are some of his uh, images. And he builds it in model form. And he's putting a skin around it. I don't know if that. Uh, and he's proposing it uh, like this. So that's the presentation. I suspect you might have some questions. How did you assess the value of using that method as a, as a way of doing design? I think in two ways. Um, the usual way is just the outcome. You know, critics sit down, do you like it, do you not like it? Um, and uh, to be frank, there's an awful lot about the urban design of how it meets the street that I found extremely uh, problematic. Not just poorly developed, but just plain wrong. Um, and I told him, I told him that. Uh, I also was disappointed in uh, his failure to really uh, allow things like structure and fire stairs to, uh, to test his design chops to see if he could maintain the dynamic power of these forms and have it meet code. Like I required of all my students, and I thought it would make this project much stronger if he were able to demonstrate, we got your fire stairs, you got your structural loads are all being pulled into the core, uh, which allows things to cantilever. Uh, but I don't feel he, he didn't really have time to develop that. And he chose not to develop that as much. So from an urban design structure and code perspective, um, he took a hit. I found it inadequate. Uh, but not for their own sake. I felt that um, there was a missed opportunity to demonstrate the full potential of the power of his approach. Because if he's able to do all of this in such a short amount of time, I believed it should not be that difficult to do the things that we see students do routinely, which is comply with these requirements. People around him were all complying with these requirements. If he had trouble with that, he could always ask number three, somewhere around. So, um, but in terms of the demonstration of uh, how productive, uh, I found myself extremely jealous of how productive he was. He hit upon a method where he uh, was capable of losing his sense of self. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever, has, any, has anyone ever felt lost in their work, kind of being pulled along by the work itself? It's, how does that feel? Is it scary? Or is it blissful? Or a little bit of both? Well, everyone around him in the studio was so jealous of him because he was just there. And, and every week, he would have this major uh, advancement of his project. And regardless of the outcome, he was having so much fun. And he was, fear was, was nowhere around. Like, he was not, there were cloaks of fear surrounding and anxiety surrounding. I mean, have you ever been frightened and cloaked in fear and anxiety? Yeah? I, I think I, I see some cloaks of fear. Um, yeah, that's the normal situation in architecture school is self-doubt. Is there, has anyone been afraid of failing? Not doing great? 
Yeah, come on, everybody. So he was able to liberate himself from a fear of failure because he had this powerful method that was capable of catapulting him forward at multiple checkpoints. Yeah, and I mean, I think the thing with an abstract exercise like that is that you know, the, the need to sort of tie it back into a reality of constructability, safety, et cetera, et cetera, you defer that as long as possible. Because if you have to confront that early in the method, you doubt the method as, you know, as a vehicle. And mm -hmm. it's a vehicle for creativity rather than a vehicle, a vehicle for results. I mean, you know, I think it's safe to say you would never set out to build that building. Well, certainly not this version of it. Yeah. But uh, he now works for Con Peterson Fox, uh, and I should check in with him. Yeah. Um, actually, I'd like to wait a decade or two. Um, although I mean, he he's expressed an inclination to go to business, going to business. And wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's interesting because I I went to school in an environment uh, where the idea of using a a plan as a section was something that you yeah. talked about all the time. Right. And, you know, it was kind of like it was an exercise. You know, yeah. it was like a third year exercise, a fourth year exercise, mm -hmm. but it never had to, you know, resolve itself in terms of the criteria of, say, comprehensive studio or, right. you know, or a thesis that is grounded in a real site. You know, the interesting notion of sort of a stack tower where you stack up disparate elements. You know? mm -hmm. I wonder what is, whether he utilized somewhere in his process kind of precedents like uh, Kachin Junga by, you know, Korea or in the M MVRDV yes. or, you know, you know, you know, people who stack, yeah. you know, disparate elements and then find a way to kind of thread them together. You know, and, you know, the, the kind of levels of productiveness where someone like Neudelings, for example, mm -hmm. in his Antwerp Museum, you know, will take a very dramatic section and then just kind of repeat it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and spiral it around. You know, I've had a thesis project like this in the past where somebody basically stacked up stuff and when we figured out the last piece of the Jenga tower, mm -hmm. he was done. You know, which uh -huh. is not, right, you not. Know, what you want. You know, it's sort of like, oh, okay. You know, and you walk away. We don't, so it's, we don't do comprehensive studio and thesis. Right. No, we get we, it we done do with it. in junior year, and then they're released to... But, but as we say, you can't unknow what you already know. You can't exactly. know how to... You can't make something unsafe if you know how to make it safe. Right, and we're struggling with that. We're going through accreditation right now, too. And it's remarkable how uh, adamantly our students insist that they don't know things that they knew a mere four <laughs> months earlier. So yeah, when the accreditors ask you if you know how to do stuff, you know how to do stuff. So the um, the ground floor, I mean he It's beautiful. Yeah, I think there are fire stairs, although I'm not seeing them right now. <laughs> but he seemed to be unfazed by uh, making these structure and circulation unproblematically the next criteria for testing success and failure. And that uh, these forms can do so many things that this is one more thing it can do. Well, I mean, it's phenomenal exploration. I mean, it's just so much fun to, to sort of imagine the creativity that goes into, you know, developing this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's a, a theme that is de derived from the realm of architecture. You know, the sort of the transformable nature of, of certain kinds of architectural organizations. And it's all in the, in, the, in the realm of ideas. So, you know, the challenge is, does the realm of ideas, you know, coexist with the realm of, you know, the construction context, the realm of, you know, context. So, yeah. that's a thesis. Yeah. That certainly is right. a thesis. Yeah. So, do you guys go to twelve thirty or? Yeah, we're we're kind of done. I mean, okay. twelve twenty. We turn we're it done. But if anyone has any last questions or, or uh, comments, well, thank you, everyone. This was. Thank you.